foot on the ancient streets of Jerusalem. We'll sail the Sea of Galilee, pray at the Western Wall, and so much more. We'll have guides for our group, lavish food, and luxurious accommodations. No other trip will be like this one. Come with Dennis and me this October. Register today. Call 855-565-5519. 855-565-5519. Or go to StandWithIsraelTour.com. StandWithIsraelTour.com. In news, I'm Ron DeRostra. Violence resumed for a second straight night in Jerusalem after Palestinian worshippers barricaded themselves inside, inside El Aqsa Mosque in the old city's sensitive compound, and Israeli police used force to remove them. The unrest was less intense than the previous night, but the situation remained combustible as Muslims marking the Ramadan holy month and Jews began a week long Passover holiday. The body of a U.S. man missing since February 11th was found in a clandestine burial pit on Mexico's Baja California Peninsula. Prosecutors say a local man and his sister were taken into custody in connection with his death. Overseas Asian shares trading mostly lower as investors turn their attention to upcoming earnings reports and other economic indicators. Benchmarks fell in Tokyo, Sydney, and Seoul, with little changed in Hong Kong and Shanghai. SRN News. Jerry Root. So, Doctor, let's talk about the abolition of man. It is a profound book, but it's interesting. You could you could make the argument, especially if you read it when it was originally published in 1940s, that C.S. Lewis was complaining about something that wasn't that big of a deal, in the sense that okay, it's a, it's a children's book, the control of language, a critical approach to reading and writing, which was published in 1939, and he makes this mass, almost a prophecy, a prediction of where this is going to head and, you know, talking about moral subjectivity versus the natural law, but it turns out that C.S. Lewis was not being hyperbolic, he was not exaggerating, he basically found a singular example of a societal tumor and warned what will happen if this line of thinking metastasizes. Tell us about the abolition of man. It was very, like you suggested. But by the way, Charlie, I'm really impressed by your comments, how deeply you understand Lewis. Well done. Thank you. But the thing is, though, he was very present. He saw ahead of time where problems were going to come. And the educational institution is one area, and he's talking about we're not paying enough attention to the kinds of ideologies that are inculcated in the students' minds when we don't pay attention to their textbooks. He's reading this when he does the abolition of man in the 40s. It's incredible. But the big core of that book is he's arguing for truth. And for Lewis, truth is not reality. Truth is what I think about reality when I think accurately about it. So if I can get people to doubt reality, I have lost the possibility of truth even occurring. If I can say, you're not the gender you actually were born with, you're something else. If I can begin to say all kinds of things that cause people to second-guess reality itself, truth dies in the process. And so Lewis talks about that in that book. That first chapter is very profound. He talks about the fact that Coleridge, Samuel Taylor Coleridge, was at a waterfall that Count is recorded in Dorothy Wordsworth's uh, Grasmere Journals, 1803. He's at the Coraline waterfall on the River Clyde, and he sees these two tourists watching the cataract, and one of them says it's pretty, and the other one says it's sublime. And Coleridge endorses the one who says it's sublime and disagrees with the one who says it's pretty. He doesn't agree, disagree with the fact that both of them were making comments about the objective reality of the waterfall, but one of them was making a more robust statement about it is sublime as a platonic ideal of waterfulness as opposed to the one saying it was just pretty. And the authors of the Green Book, the book he's trying to deconstruct, say Coleridge had no right to make that judgment. They weren't waterfall, but only something about their own feelings. 
And what they did was they dissected the reality of the waterfall from any claim that the people were making. But it gets worse than that, because the authors of the Green Book, Gaius and Titius, as Lewis refers to them, they're making a judgment about Coleridge. Coleridge's judgment is based on the reality. Their judgment is not based on any reality whatsoever. But they're making a judgment, and they're trying to assume it totally subjectivistic. And in some senses, in that degree, leads anarchy. Because it isn't, has nothing to do with reality whatsoever. It has to do with whatever I want things to be. And then he introduces a phrase that I don't think people quite understand, but I think it will look through it. Men, you have the brain, the head, and then you have the chest. The, 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 the emotions, you have the visceral also, but the emotional features, Lewis says you can make true statements about emotion as well. So, so um, if I don't understand that, my guess is I'm, I'm liable to go off course that way as well. There has to be a reality that validates the emotion. Um, if, if you see a person who's just lost their spouse, in a car accident or something like that, you don't expect them to be giddy. You don't expect them to be happy. That's incongruous with the reality that should support that emotion. If you see a person who's morose in a situation of happiness, if I'm going to a birthday party to celebrate with my friends, I want to go have a, a happy time. If I get a phone call on the way that my friend was hurt in a car accident, I probably will call the friend who's having the birthday and say, something's come up, I'll tell you about it later. I, I won't be able to be there. And I go to the hospital, see my friend there to grieve with them, to be with them, to mourn with them, and so on. But you don't go spoil the birthday party because the emotion of, that's congruous with the accident is not congruous with the experience of the party. So Lewis is talking about it in that regard. The sentiments can be just. If they can be just, then there must be a standard to judge whether this is the accurate sentiment or not. So I think that's the way Lewis is using that concept. I was moved, and it was a curious... I'm exactly sure why. Maybe you can help me understand why Lewis decided to bring in the Tao, or the T-A-O. I'm not sure the pronunciation, or the Tao, the way. Which, again, I, as soon as I hear the way, I think of kind of a hearkening back to core Christian theology. Sure. But he was making an argument that I think of a universality of the human being's, you know, posture towards a specific telos, right? A teleological pur purpose for existence. Is, is that is that correct? Charlie, you missed your calling. You should have been a Lewis scholar. You're nailing it pretty well, actually. I'm impressed. He uses the word, you could say Tao if you want, or Tao, but he uses an Eastern word, and he defines it this way. The Tao is the doctrine of objective value, the belief that certain things are really true and other things really false to the kind of thing we are and the kind of thing the universe is. He uses an Eastern term because he wants to show, even in a Western world, these ideas are not merely Western. They're universal. In the appendix of that book, he gives quotes from all kinds of readings. He gives quotes from Confucius's Analects. He gives quotes from um, Western philosophers, Plato, Aristotle. He gives quotes from, from Muslim scholars, uh, Jewish scholars, Christian scholars, uh, philosophers, all across time in the Moriam and across culture. Because he's trying to show this concept of understanding reality so that I could begin to approximate truth is really important. Now, the abolition of man is a pre, it's almost a, 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 an introduction to Christianity by introducing people to the way we should be thinking about life if we're going to think well. And if I think well about the reality, Lewis says, I believe in Christianity as I believe the sun is risen, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. If a person turns their eyes to reality, it opens the door for them to discover what's undergirding all of reality, and it's supernatural. He gave a lecture at Oxford University called, um, the, on the English syllabus. This is in 1930s, just a few years after he had become a Christian. And he said to the students, we have fulfilled our whole duty to you as your teachers, if we can help you see some given tract of reality. So let's say I help a student get to a book and help them to interpret what the author is saying well 
in a way that's coherent and consistent with what the author intended. Sometimes that's benefited by getting a community around the text so I can benefit from the perspectives of the people there, but it's still a perspective rooted in the reality of the text itself. And Lewis saw if a person got connected to reality well, they can develop beyond that to the reality that undergirds all other reality in our world. It's a very important book, Abolition of Man. You argue with reality, welcome to hell. So now I want to I want to focus on your book because abolition of man and mere Christianity are usually actually not neglected. So tell us what what is the neglected CS? Well, first off, that's a book of mine, not the book. I've got I've got a bunch of books on Lewis, but the the thing about this book, I like to write books about Lewis that that look at things that other people are not writing about. There's so much depth to Lewis, but Lewis's best books, hand down are his literary critical works. And again, he's helping his readers see something of reality there. And you can develop habits by doing that that will benefit your eyesight when you look or cast your gaze anywhere. So we wanted to take, my, my friend Mark Neal and I did this together, we wanted to take books that people were really important and introduce the, the reader who maybe got to Lewis through the Narnian books or through his Christian apologetics introduce them to these other rich resources of Lewis. And they're really, actually, I think they're apologetic too because he does faith integrated thinking about these great books. There's one book, for example, Lewis wrote called English Literature in the 16th Century Excluding Drama. To write that book, he read every book written in English in the 16th century. He read every book translated into English in the original language it was written, French, Latin, Italian, and in translation so his judgments would be fair-minded. And consequently, it took him about 18 years to write it. He wrote it for the Oxford History of English Literature. It was quite a burden for him. Oh Hell, he called it, his Oh Hell book, Oxford History of English Literature. But when he wrote that book, he was also writing Near Christianity, the Narnian books, he was writing his science fiction book. He did a lot of other work, but he is He's really pouring into this, and you discover as you read it in his comments, by the way, you laugh your way through, it's full of mirth, it's wonderful, it's a 700 page book, but it's well worth the reading. And, and as you read it, you find that he opens up more than wardrobe doors. And, and there, there's one author he referred to, Michael Drayton, a 16th century poet. And I read what Lewis said about Drayton, I said, I, I don't want to leave Drayton untouched, man, I've got to go read Drayton, so I read all of Drayton's works as well. Lewis does this, he ignites your heart and soul and mind to grow and want to keep growing. I think it's important. I want to say one other comment about this. I didn't go to college because I had any academic interest. I think I read four books before college, not counting comic books. I went to college to play sports. In the beginning of my freshman year, I became a Christian, read through my Bible from cover to cover that day. I try to do that every year, ever since. But somebody introduced me to Lewis. And I started reading Lewis, and my faith started to develop. And when I would share Christ with the guys I was playing football with, they would ask me hard questions. I didn't know the answers to questions, but I found Lewis was a, was a rich source of answers to their questions. I graduated from college, and the person wisely said to me, you do not get an education in college. You lay a foundation for your education. And commencement, the graduation exercises, means you will now commence your education by building on that foundation. Pick an author who will take you places and make that author your life study. I think he could have said, pick an, pick a, an artist, a composer, a period of history, pick a worldview, whatever it might be. I picked Lewis. I go to grad school, I'm studying theology, I have to write a thesis. There was no way I was going to write a thesis on the use of the optative mood in the Greek text of Philemon. It wasn't going to hold but I asked if I could write on Lewis, and they said, yeah. So I put pen to paper, I started writing on Lewis. I've been studying him for 53 years. I've been teaching him for 43 years. I've lectured on him in 89, 81 universities in 19 different countries. Patriot Mobile.